Hello, everyone. So yeah, my name's Tim, and uh, I wrote a Game Boy emulator. And not only did I do that, I wrote it in JavaScript. And I think everyone else should too. Um, I should start by saying I'm, I'm self-taught, and I quite often, uh, well, some of the things I say might just be wrong, or I, I often find holes in my knowledge. It happens embarrassingly frequently, but you can't argue with the result because the, the emulator works. So, um, and you can play it after this talk. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, maybe you should write it in JavaScript. <laughs> so the question I get asked often, uh, maybe not so much from this crowd, is uh, why? Why would you do this? Uh, first reason is there's already loads of Game Boy emulators. Um, and particularly if you wanted a web-based one, there's you know, WebAssembly. You could just port an existing emulator to WASM and uh, it'd be, it would run faster and it'd be easier to make. Uh, but that misses the point. Um, uh, the short answer is, it's fun. <laughs> uh, so an analogy I can give is a Rubik's Cube. Here's a Rubik's Cube, if you haven't seen one before. Um, the whole point of a Rubik's Cube is to solve it. You're, you're just moving bits of plastic around. If you just wanted it to be solved, you could just take it apart or peel the stickers off. Nobody questions, oh, why are you doing that Rubik's Cube? It's, it's understood that it's just for the challenge. Uh, Yet somehow with a Game Boy emulator, because it does something at the end, it's like it's not allowed to be for fun. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. So uh, Game Boy emulators. Why is a Game Boy perfect for emulation? Um, well, first of all, it's challenging but achievable. Uh, it is very hard. There are easier things to emulate, but Game Boy is just about doable by one person on their own. Um, another reason is that the hardware is fairly simple. There are a lot of sim uh, similar era consoles which are not necessarily harder, but tedious. For instance, the, uh, the NES, Famicom, they tended to put a lot of like, custom hardware in the cartridges. So in order to emulate all of the games, you have to emulate all of that custom hardware. And there's like hundreds of different types of cartridge. And for the Game Boy, there are, there's a bit of that, you know, there's things like the Game Boy camera, but uh, there's, basically there's just five main types of uh, memory bank controller on the cartridge. So it's, it's easier than some other consoles in that sense, or less tedious. Um, another thing is that it's already reverse engineered because, well, if you're writing an emulator for a modern console, most of the work is reverse engineering what the hardware does. Uh, but in the case of the Game Boy, if you don't want to do all that reverse engineering, people have done it for you, and you can focus just on the emulation. Uh, another point I wanted to make is that it feels like a fractal, because there's something about it. When you, when you start to write the emulator, you can get Tetris running very early on. Maybe 20% maybe of an emulator is enough to run Tetris. Uh, and yet, you know, you, you then have to patch all of the things that don't work for other games. Uh, Tetris doesn't use any of like the, the graphics features apart from like the very basic stuff, and it doesn't have a memory bank controller at all. Uh, yeah, so um, moving on to... Oh yes, I love bare metal machine code. I love JavaScript. How can I combine these things? By writing an emulator in JavaScript. Ta-da! Uh, <laughs> Um, so an emulator is a description of how a computer works, and if you've not written an emulator, do you really know how computers work? Well, how do we start? How do we, what's the first thing to do to make an emulator? Well, there is a cartridge, for instance, Tetris, and uh, what's on there? Well, it's a ROM, it's, it's filled with bytes. Uh, what do those bytes mean? Well, they're instructions for the CPU. Uh, what is the CPU? Well, on, on the Game Boy, the CPU is almost a Z80. It's, uh, it's got a few instructions added, a few taken away, but it's basically a Z80. Uh, that table there, which is probably too small to see, uh, is someone's made a, a lovely diagram of all of the instructions, but basically, it's mostly one byte instructions. One byte is read from memory and does something. Uh, for instance, it might move some memory from one place to another, or work with registers. The, uh, all, all CPUs, well, I know, use registers, which uh, 
they're basically like hands for the CPU. You pick something up, you do something with it, you put it back. Um, so how can we emulate that? How can you make a, uh, say, the load instruction move from one register to another? Well, we could have a switch statement. We could just say, read each byte. What does that byte do? Have a condition, do, do it to our virtual memory. You know, have an array that is our RAM, array that is our registers. Uh, but of course, what's, what's the most JavaScript solution? Well, my approach was to do this, which, what are we doing here? We've got an opcode array, and it's filled with function pointers. And uh, <laughs> the thing at the top is a function factory. So to, to make it less tedious to write, I've, I've defined a bunch of constants, that's capital A, B, C, uh, capital R, E, G, reg, are the registers, and I'm returning a function which moves from one register to another. And then at the end of the function, it advances PC, which is a program counter, which tells, there's a spider on my display. <laughs> Uh, the PC, which is pointing to what current byte is being read. Uh, and so then the emulator is just that. It's while true, execute the current opcode. Um, done, right? That's, that's it. We've got a processor working. There's, there's a few more things. You have to count cycles for some of the instructions and some of them are two bytes. Oh, but that gets handled by this because it'll just advance the PC by, by more. Um, I got to this point, I was like, yeah, yeah, it, it runs, it's great, that, that's, that's, it's done. Uh, but unfortunately, the CPU is only a small part of the emulator. So, um... oh yes, the boot code. I'll come back to that. <laughs> After we've got our uh, display, our CPU working, the next thing is the display. It turns out that writing the display is or maybe two or three times as much work as writing the CPU. It's not like a frame buffer where you just put pixels. No, you've got, you've got hardware that renders tiles and sprites or object attrib attribute memory. Uh, you've got palettes that can be swapped. You've got a thing called the window. That's in that screenshot you've got uh, where it says pause in the bottom. That is a separate bank of tiles that can be superimposed called the window. I don't know why it's called the window. Uh, it's used for all kinds of things. It's only used for pause there. You've also got the uh, coincidence interrupt, which, it, you know, sometimes you're looking at the hardware and you think, oh, what uses that? A simple game like Mario isn't going to use like a scanline coincidence interrupt, but no, it does. The background, where it's a, an arrangement of tiles, gets shifted as the level moves along. But also in the background, you've got the top two rows, which is, you know, Mario, uh, world, time, and number of coins, whatever those two rows are rendered into the background tiles, and as the frame is drawn, partway through, at line 17, it will trigger the coincidence interrupt, which then changes the value of the background. Uh, so even a simple game like this uses it. And then like more complicated games like, uh, you know, the, the opening to Zelda Link's Awakening, where you've got like that parallax effect of them scrolling, uh, that's all done with the coincidence interrupt. And some games do even more. They, they, they interrupt mid-scan line just to do like, effects and stuff. Uh, so there's a lot to the display, but seeing the Nintendo logo for the first time is glorious, getting it to run. Uh, and then even when you think it's done, right, you get, get these, uh, this happened, everything looked fine until I got to this, this is the first dungeon of uh, Link's Awakening, and there's, the heart is too high, and there's a quarter heart underneath. And it's like, what? Uh, what it is is that, it uses uh, this 8x16 uh, sprite mode, and it's accessing sprites. Uh, the hardware, officially, you can, you can access it either by the high byte or the high tile or the low tile. It accesses the next sequential tile in memory, and the way the game is written, it always accesses it by the first tile, except in this one instance, it accesses it by the second tile, and because I didn't Basically, you just have to zero the low byte, but I hadn't spotted that, and it just, you can get quite far into the game before spotting these weird things. I mean, uh, that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, yes, more on that. But once, uh, once you've got the display working, you can then start working on the sound, which is generally agreed to be the hardest bit of all. Now, there's a few reasons why it's hard. One is that, like, you know, generating square waves that aren't anti-aliased is difficult. That's not a problem in JavaScript because we've got the Web Audio API, but um, the main reason it's hard is that it's not actually that well documented. A lot of it is things like, you know, you can have a square wave do a sweep in volume, but 
how long does that sweep take? And it's, it's just a little bit um, unclear in many places. And also some games do weird things like instead of muting a channel, they'll just send like a zero length sweep to make it, make it turn off. So you can have the sound working perfectly in one game and then not working at all in another. Um, but the hardest part of the sound is the noise channel, which I thought was just, you know, like noise for percussion. It's more than that. You've got uh, a linear feedback shift register, which is pseudo random noise generator, and you can control both the clock speed to that and the uh, period of the, um, the tap point on the, on the LFSR. So it's used for, well, if you think of the Link's Awakening opening screen, you've got the shore noises going shh, and you've got the thunder noise going and you've also got, as the title screen appears, it goes ka uh, So all of that's done with just sending different numbers to the linear feedback shift register. Um, Here's an interesting moment. This is when you go to res uh, rescue Bow Wow in Link's Awakening. At this point in my emulator, it just crashed entirely. It's like, it was, it was working fine, just completely hung. The reason was, the actual hardware, what's happening is, it's only got a certain number of address lines to the cartridge. For some reason, at this point, it loads another memory bank, which is just like way off, you, very, very high number that's non-existent. And of course, in actual hardware, it just wraps because it doesn't have that extra address line. So um, here's a, it's a fun reason. Uh, it's an explanation of why you have to play the game all the way through to the end to, uh, to prove that it works. Because I think a lot of people write emulators and they show the title screen and it's just, uh, I made sure to play as many games as I could to the end. Here's the ending screen of Link's Awakening. I've just ruined it for anyone who hasn't played it. Um, and there's Mario. Uh, let's go back to the boot code bit. So when you first turn on the Game Boy, it doesn't have an operating system, uh, but it does have the boot code. So the purpose of the boot code is to load up the Nintendo logo and go ka-ding. Uh, and the, the reason they had that was for like legal defense. So if you had a, uh, an unauthorized cartridge, it wouldn't run unless it included the Nintendo logo. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the boot code, I thought it was kind of interesting. It's, it's, it was ripped by looking at the, uh, the silicon die. Someone traced out the, uh, the links in, in, the, in the microscope image. So that's just an interesting point to add. Um, yeah, so uh, what else did I skip over? The, um, I didn't talk about memory mapped uh, peripherals. So, kind of interesting to think like, so once you've got your, your CPU working and your registers, how does it actually talk to the display or to the sound hardware? Um, it's, all just, it's all just talking to bits of memory. Um, like, how do you read the controller? That's, uh, when you press a button on the controller, what's that doing? It's, it's making an electrical signal go high and you can just read a bit of memory from, from that address and that tells you the state of the controller. Uh, yeah. I have a fair bit of time left, so I would, hmm, should I try and load up? We didn't uh, arrange the sound. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, that's pretty much the end of my talk, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I would like to uh, convince you all that writing an emulator is a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I think I'm about five minutes short, so feel free to ask me questions. We, we can do sound. We can we can do sound? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show the emulator basically. <laughs> uh, can I put it onto that screen? Okay, the sound's coming out of my laptop, so. Uh... <laughs> so there you can see the uh, parallax scrolling in the, uh, in the waves. That's coincidence into it being used there. I think the sound is coming out of my speakers on the laptop. Yeah. I don't know how to rewrite route that. I'm not sure either. To be I can confirm it is working. I can hear it. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. One of the games I didn't get to emulate correctly is Prehistoric Man, which 
it's, it's like a 90s demo in the opening. It does like pseudo 3D effects. Very cool. Very good music in that game. Prehistoric Man. Really like it. Um, yes. And if you, if you missed it, the, the URL is mitzal.com slash SWATGB. It's stupid waste of time, Game Boy. So <laughs> SWATGB is the emulator. Have a, have a go on it. And um, yeah. How many minutes left do I have? <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Well, the, the original idea was to try and write the whole thing in one day, and I didn't manage that. Uh, just about got the CPU done in one day. Uh, after, after I got Tetris working on like, I don't know, a few days in, then lost a few more days to playing Tetris. Uh, <laughs> overall, I mean, I, I estimate it was, I don't know, maybe three weeks? A bit longer. I mean, I, I, I'm a very obsessive person, so I, I kind of just ah, emulator. Ah. Uh, so I don't know. It, it, yeah, I, I actually made a time lapse of me writing the emulator, uh, which you can find on the page. If you go to the emulator, there's a link to an about page where there's lots more information, and um, yeah, there's there's a time lapse I put on YouTube, which is generated from the Git history, which is. Uh, uh, yeah, you, it's kind of funny to look at. <laughs> Is anyone convinced to write an emulator? Come on, it's really good. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, some of you. <laughs> well, I certainly am as well, to be honest. But it's also bringing back bad memories of uh, when I was doing writing a compiler coursework and stuff like that too, or <laughs> yeah. writing, um, what was it, a MIPS uh, emulator as well. I had to write one of those for coursework. Oof. Doing it for coursework, not fun. Doing it for fun, fun. The, yes. All right. So thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was very, very eye-opening, and I'm certainly am inspired as well. So thank you.